people can join. We don't need to admit them manually. So, yeah. Uh, so, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Sofia. I'm a board member of WC Silicon Valley. I uh, just wanted to mention that this is this event will be recorded and shared on Netflix YouTube channel. Uh, we will only be recording the uh, presentation, uh, not the QA. So for those who are joining WISIS event for the first time, we would like to share some information about our, our organization. So Women in Cybersecurity is a community of engagement and support for women in, uh, in the security field. It's um, the community dedicated to bringing together uh, women in cybersecurity from academia, research, industry, uh, to share knowledge, experience, and also to network uh, and monitor. So our mission is um, recruiting, retaining, advancing women in the field of cybersecurity. And this is accomplished through uh, volunteering. Here are the amazing people I'm working with to um, help ac accomplish this mission. If you are, so if you are interested in uh, being a member, uh, you should uh, definitely reach out. So you have, um, if, if you are, uh, we, you will be a part of like a powerful community of peers where we are share ideas and best practices. Uh, you will also gain access to a community forum to network. You can ask questions there. Uh, you can um, do a lot of networking. It's, it's uh, super interesting and useful. You will have access to working groups, uh, monthly meetings, also to meetups and events. Uh, we see Silicon Valley usually have um, an event, uh, an event every month, uh, but there are more events uh, out there. Uh, there are many uh, we see uh, all around the world. So if you are interested in being a member, uh, please check this link here. There are WCS affiliates all around the world, as I said. Uh, so once you join, please make sure to link your profile with WCS Silicon Valley affiliate in the form. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. So we are also on social media and we encourage you to connect with us to learn more about our next events. And before moving to our um, presentation, I would like to thank our sponsors, Netflix and Arcos Labs, uh, who are helping us accomplish our mission. So let's now move on to our super exciting talk around how Netflix leans into risk-based quantification and prioritization. Our speakers today are Shannon and Prashanti. They are both senior engineers at Netflix. Uh, Shannon focuses on building data-driven detections while Prashanti focuses on providing risk-based decision supports with, uh, within security and technology. So welcome Shannon and Prashanti. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Thank you for the beautiful introduction, Sophia. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Yeah, and while Prashanti is doing that, uh... Thank you everyone for, for attending for attending our talk today. Uh, I'm Shannon, it's so nice to virtually meet you all. And hello everyone, I'm Prashanti Kauta. I'm a senior risk engineer at Netflix. Thanks everyone for uh, joining our presentation. We hope you like it and uh, also find it insightful. We are going to focus on the application of risk analysis in the sense of how to understand quantify and diversify risk so it can be managed more effectively. Before I dive deeper into the topic, let's spend a moment on the terms risk and quantification as you're going to hear us use these terms quite a bit in the next 30 minutes. Risk is something one bears and is the outcome of uncertainty. And when we think about uncertainty, there are three levels of uncertainties in the world, the known, the unknown and the unknowable. The known is of course what we know will occur like contractual obligations, a guaranteed event. The known is what we do not know but can be simulated like the uncertainty of whether a technology can be developed successfully. Such events will become known um, 
with time and action. And such events carry with them risks, but can be eliminated over time. The unknowable risks or events, however, carry both uncertainty and risk, and they may not be reduced or eliminated over time. Uh, one example being earthquake or uh, tsunami. In a traditional analysis, we care about the known factors, but in a risk analysis, we care about all, the known, the unknown, and the unknowable to reduce the level of uncertainty. That's the goal of a risk analysis, is to reduce the level of uncertainty. And what do we mean by quantification? We are expressing probability and impact mathematically as numbers in a, in a range as part of a distribution. We are not using qualitative models. Qualitative models, uh, um, by that I mean red, yellow, green, or high, medium, low, essentially using an ordinal scale to rank and order data without establishing any degree of variance between them. Netflix moved away from qualitative risk analysis as it was very difficult to make decisions based on colors. Uh, one example being, we cannot really compare project cost versus risk exposure reduction using colors, but no change of uh, paradigm comes quickly. We took baby steps to transition from a qualitative risk analysis or a qualitative program to a quantitative program. What really helped kickstart our quantification journey was uh, establishing standardized risk terminology and uses, using existing processes, uh, be it semi-qualitative, semi-quantitative, or fully qualitative process, but use that process and add more rigor to, to the existing process. That really helped us. Now for any stakeholder to accept a new set of advanced analytical approach, the model itself must have some degree of applicability to the problem at hand. And it shouldn't merely be an academic exercise or an afterthought. So before choosing the model, we identified the types of problems and decisions that need to be made. And we use the tiering methodology to enable both strategic as well as tactical decision-making. Now tier one risks, Tier one risks can be a list of existential uh, and persistent company risks like data compromise that senior management needs to be aware of. And this view of risk can be used to make long-term strategic uh, investment decisions. Now, if we come to tier two risks, tier two risks are more tactical. This across, uh, across applications, domains, platforms, or business unit. This view can be used to evaluate how well uh, our security investments, our current security investments are working. If we come to tier three risks, tier three risks are very operational. We usually take tier two risks as a starting point to determine what scenarios warrant a deeper dive. Now, as I mentioned uh, before, tier two risks are our starting point. We identify and analyze tier two risks and aggregate them into tier one. We use a version of Brunswick lens model modified for technology risk to perform a large number of quantitative analysis in a very short period of time. Shannon is going to talk more about uh, the model with an example shortly. To analyze tier three risks, we have chosen FAIR, the FAIR model, which is factor analysis of information risk. This view or this uh, tier or this risk view is usually a detailed analysis of tier two risks by performing uh, comparison analysis, controls evaluation analysis. And I'm going to present an example of controls evaluation using FAIR in just a few slides. But before we dive uh, deep into the models mentioned in the previous slides, let's understand what is risk and what makes up risk. Risk is a term that's, uh, that's you know, that people use, different people use it very differently. So the modern definition of risk is tied to modern probability theory, which was uh, developed in 1600s. So the equation itself remains unchanged, but the applicability of this equation has changed from time to time. Now, there are many definitions, both inside and outside the field of risk management, but we use the fair definition of risk, which is the probable frequency and probable magnitude of future loss. 
uh, as i just mentioned risk is one term uh, that that so uh, over uh, exploited or it's being used by different people very differently so to ensure the risk models are applied consistently we need to make sure the risk scenarios are consistent for apples to apples comparison we need to standardize how uh, we think about risk so to determine to determine the probability uh, or the probable frequency and probable magnitude which is risk we consider the asset we care about and by asset i mean it can be an employee it can be a company's reputation it can be an application or a platform so what is it that we care about as a company the threat acting against what we care about and the threat can be anything like a state sponsored attacker a cyber criminal or a disgruntled employee so we have the asset the threat acting against the asset and the resulting consequence of that action and the resulting consequence can be a direct financial loss to the company or a confidentiality availability or integrity loss now let's take this uh, risk scenario uh, let's keep this in mind uh, because it's going to be uh, super helpful for uh, uh, the presentation as we move forward um i'm going to hand it off to shannon now to walk us through the brinswick lens model with an example thanks prashanti Okay, can you see my screen okay now? Perfect, thank you. Yep. So yeah, I'm gonna be covering how we use machine learning to model risk at scale. So to begin modeling, we define the problem that we wanna answer and we take that in the form of a risk scenario. So using the formula that Prashanthi mentioned before, we're gonna analyze the risk of an external actor impacting confidentiality of sensitive data via an application attack. So we got this idea from the How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk book, which is a really accessible book to learn about risk quantification. The chapter nine will describe in detail something called the lens model, which is, is what we use here. I definitely highly recommend this book if you're wanting to learn more about risk quantification. So our goal is to figure out which applications are the riskiest. And Prashanti talked a little bit about, about categories and using them to uh, assess risk but they're not useful in ranking hundreds of applications against each other. So if we have hundreds of apps that are red, is one app more red than the other? Um, so we wanted to use quantification so that we have a better way to compare our applications. We also wanna understand which features will increase risk and which controls will reduce risk. And are there combinations of features that cause our experts more concern? Um, so with that in mind, we built our application risk model. So we define frequency as the number of times a year a loss will occur. For an example, um, an event occurring once every two years could be represented as 0.5. Um, we could also have something that's gonna occur three times a year. So this is just gonna be a number from zero to many. For the initial iteration of our model, we used a single value for frequency, but for future iterations, we'd like to use a range for frequency so that we can capture some uncertainty about how often something might occur. Magnitude is captured in $2 values. So it's gonna be a, a low magnitude, which is kind of the best case scenario of a loss. And then the high magnitude, which is the worst case scenario where as much as possible is lost. We map these two values to a magnitude, uh, to a log normal distribution. So a log normal distribution won't go below zero, but it also has a long tail to capture unlikely but combined losses. And if you want to learn more details about how to build, um, how to map data to a log normal distribution, the Python SciPy package um, explains how you can create a log normal distribution along with the parameters. So annualized loss in dollars gives us a number that we can use to rank applications and explain potential risk to other teams. So the formula that we use to get that annualized loss value is the magnitude distribution mean times the frequency. So starting with the magnitude distribution mean, uh, these are just two um, example values, but I just wanted to show that, that the distribution mean for a log normal distribution is gonna look a little different than uh, the distribution maybe of a normal distribution. 
And then this is a sample value for frequency. So again, it doesn't have to be multiple times a year. It can be once over many years. So the formula for that would just be um, if you wanted to have a frequency that was one time in the next n years, it'd be one over n. So one time in the next five years would be one over five or 0.2. So this having this quantification, like, like Prashanti mentioned, moves us from an ordinal scale of low, medium, or high, or, or red, yellow, green, to a ratio scale. So this gives us a, a number that can have descriptive and inferential statistics applied to it. We can use this to rank our applications. So to build this model on frequency, we're going to use a labeled data set. Uh, the predictor values that we use in the model are a combination of security controls and application risk features. So this list shows a sample of potential features that someone might use. These aren't the exact features that we use, um, but they give you some common security features that might be useful in your environment. And so we pull these features back for 50 applications. Um, I used dbscan, which is an unsupervised clustering algorithm to cluster um, the features for all of our applications. And then I messed with the parameters until I got 50 clusters and then was able to select a set of applications that were representative of all of our overall applications. So we get the target variable for our model from a survey of experts. And when we were doing the survey, we hid the application name from the experts so that they wouldn't leak information into uh, the model. So we want them just to use the features that we pull um, so that we can distribute that to um, across to all of our applications. So this is a sample of the survey that we gave to our experts. So we hid the application name and we said for each of these features, let's use this to answer the question that we created earlier. So that is how many times over the next year will external actors impact the confidentiality of sensitive data by an application attack? So their forecast is gonna be a number from zero to many, and they're gonna time bound that to one year. And then they'll do that for 50 applications. So once they have answered those surveys, we will review the data to make sure that since we're using really small data to build a model, we want to make sure that the data quality is high. And this visualization shows uh, the frequency of loss on the y axis and the application on the x axis, and then individual colors per forecaster. You can see at the bottom, most of the forecasters were clustered together, but our forecaster in purple had a little bit of um, a different understanding of some of the controls. So when we reviewed these results, we were able to figure out that some of the forecasted scores needed to be changed, and we made that adjustment. And this is a, a really important step. Um, so before we build a model with the data, we want to make sure that it's accurate. And then we also want to remove outliers. So you can see a, a spike in green here, and I think that was just a typo on my part. But again, visualizing the data is a, a helpful way to, to see outliers. And once we have a clean data, data, clean labeled data set, we can build a model of frequency. So again, 50 applications is a really small number to use to build a model. So we're gonna have careful review of the input and also the results and use our model with a lot of monitoring. So the how to measure anything book has more details, but they reference research that's shown that the mean of a survey of experts is more accurate uh, than a value from an individual. So the mean of our expert forecast per application is the target variable for our model. So we fit a regression model uh, using XGBoost, which is a library that builds gradient boosted trees. We tried several models. We tried linear regression, random forest, um, support vector machines, and XGBoost had the lowest root mean squared error. So once we figured out the best model, we pulled the features for, uh, um, sorry, we built the model and then we pulled features from our asset inventory for all active applications and predicted a frequency for each. And so these are just sample features, but I wanted to show you a nice, uh, a nice part of XGBoost. So once the model is fit, um, XGBoost will output, output feature importance. And this shows which features contributed the most information to the model. So these aren't necessarily the features that will reduce the most risk or features that contribute to the most risk, but rather 
these are the features that our experts considered the most important when creating the forecast. So this can just give uh, the experts a little bit of intuition about how they as a team think about, think about controls and, uh, and risks. And root mean squared error was the metric that we used to evaluate the different models. Um, so this just gives us a, a number that we, so that we can, when we're looking at the output of different models, we can see the model with the lowest score is the best model for that particular data set. And then our model is used to predict a frequency for thousands of applications. So our experts had to provide a score for 50 apps, and then we were able to use that for thousands of applications. Um, so that covers frequency. So, so Prashanti showed a nice, a nice summary that uh, risk is frequency times magnitude. So to get magnitude, we use the type of data that might be lost for each application. So Prashanti's team has loss tables that have lost data per data type, like PI or PCI and response cost. So we use that along with frequency to run simulations in our risk quant library. So that's a library that I worked on with Marcus Deshawn when he was on the team. Uh, and it's open source and our slides will include a link to this at the end and we definitely welcome contributions. Um, so risk quant will map the loss to a log normal distribution. So for each of our thousands of applications, we then have our frequency model along with the risk quant library's magnitude output to create our annualized loss in dollars. And we will have that for each one of our applications. Once we do that, uh, this is another really important part of our modeling. So again, since we, we were working with small data, we want, to, we want to review this with application security to look at the results. Like are the top applications in risk expected? Are there apps that we know about that have had issues? Does the value that we've assigned make sense? And this is a good way to uncover maybe some unknown, uh, some unknown interesting things in your environment. And we wanna make sure just that the output that we're producing makes sense to our experts. And if results don't make sense, maybe we need to make some adjustments. Maybe there are some rules that we can add to um, adjust certain features. So once we've done that, we will write the dollar value to asset inventory. So I created a job that runs daily to update the annualized loss if any features change or as new applications are added. And then I also alert on changes to the distributions of the features and for the model predictions. So we don't write the results of the asset inventory if we have um, unexpected results. So we'll manually review that to make sure that the data we're writing is good. And also this process of selecting features and building a model is iterative. So things can change internally as we add new controls and externally as there are new threats. So we redo this flow to make sure that our values stay accurate. And we are experimenting with other scenarios too to see if we can scale experts' knowledge in other areas. And I am gonna hand back over to Prashanti now. Thanks, Shannon. All right. You've seen how we perform analysis at scale. Now let's take a look at a deep dive analysis. And as I'd mentioned in the previous slides, we use FAIR, uh, which is factor analysis of information risk model, because the model clearly defines the factors that make up risk, and we can work at any level of abstraction. The essence of a risk analysis though, is in the highest abstraction, which is loss event frequency, or how often will the bad thing happen, and loss magnitude, which is, how much will it cost the company when an event materializes? We always prefer to stay at higher levels of abstraction as long as we have sufficiently accurate estimates. I think the goal here is to not have uh, precise values, but to have accurate enough values to understand uh, the known, the unknown and the unknowable factors. It was really easy for us to adopt and adapt this model here at Netflix because this model uses data and an evidence-based approach. Now let's go back to Shannon's example risk scenario and determine how a decision can be made after we perform a risk analysis. The, the risk scenario under consideration here is the risk of an external actor impacting the confidentiality of sensitive data via an application attack. Let's use the same loss magnitude range for this analysis as well. 
as Shannon pointed out, we built standardized loss tables to include uh, factors like increase in customer service activity as a result of a breach, uh, the total cost of legal engagement, fines levied um, against the company, or uh, incident response costs, forensic costs, just to name a few. We used a combination of industry data and internal data, followed by subject matter expert input to forecast losses uh, based on changing laws. For frequency, because risk is a range of possibilities, we forecasted a range uh, around the most likely number of times this event could occur, and that the most likely number is picked up from uh, the lens model. But to forecast a range around the, the most likely value, we consider factors like changing threat landscape, changing control landscape, you know, the future or proposed uh, control initiatives, keeping that in mind, and also the growth of the business. So we forecast a range keeping all, all this in mind. In this case, we considered just as an example, we considered once every 10 years as the minimum and once every three years as the maximum. And the six point table you see is a result of Monte Carlo simulation where uh, values are sampled 60,000 times at random and the resulting outcomes are recorded as a probability distribution. Now 60,000 iterations can simply be thought as uh, 60,000 company years. Monte Carlo simulation shows the outcome of going for broke or the most conservative decision along with all possible consequences for the middle of uh, the road decisions. Now let's take a look at each value in the, in the table and understand what it really means. A minimum value of zero represents that in at least one simulated year, the loss event did not occur. The 10th percentile of zero and the, the 90th percentile of $200,000 means that there is an 80% probability of the loss exposure to be between zero and $200,000. Now, the most likely value, um, this, is, this is a good data point to have. The most likely value of zero represents that in the majority of simulated years, the loss event did not occur. When we, when we come to the maximum value, the maximum value is essentially to understand the worst case scenario. Uh, but one important thing, one important thing to note here is the worst case scenario, while it's possible, but it's not a, a likely problem or a probable outcome. Now we know what the baseline of risk is. So, so what, what do we do with a bunch of numbers? How do we respond to this risk based on those numbers? Now there are different types of risk responses acceptance, transference, avoidance, uh, mitigation. But today let's take a look at a risk mitigation example. What is the reduction in risk if we invest in a detection control? The first step is to determine what we intend to do to influence the risk. In this case, let's consider a hypothetical scenario where we are increasing our detection or in other words, our logging and monitoring capabilities from zero to 10%, remember we are always working in ranges. So zero to 10% to 50 to 75%. How much risk is reduced if we increase our detection capabilities and what's the methodology behind it? The high level methodology of impact on risk due to increase in detection capabilities is, uh, if we think about cyber events or cyber incidents, uh, cyber incidents are rare especially those that involve theft of thousands up to millions of records. In this example, we have used uh, a few thousand records. So when such uh, cyber incidents involving several thousand records materialize, they cost a lot to the company and more records equals higher losses for us. So when we increase our detection capabilities, events are recognized early enough to, to stop the attacker to allow an intervention while the event is still in progress and uh, it reduces the affected record count, uh, affected or compromised record count. So detection controls truly shine when there are more records at stake. Now the, the table that you see here is um, the untreated risk 
the, the results of uh, the baseline risk analysis or untreated risk and the treated risk. Uh, and what is the change in risk exposure after, if, and when we implement a detection control? Uh, as you can see, the minimum, the 10th percentile, and the mode, or most likely, they are all zero. This means that this is a low frequency, high magnitude type of event, a, a rare event with an average annualized loss of $80,000. And with detection control, the risk is reduced to $50,000. The, the data suggests that there is approximately 60% reduction in risk exposure. When you hear 60% reduction in risk, that sounds great, right? So should we, should we invest in this? Uh, but how do, we, how do we know this is a good investment, especially when we compare uh, the risk reduction with cost of control? And the, and the answer is cost benefit analysis. Now, return on security investment calculation, uh, this should indicate how much loss the organization could avoid due to the security investment. We can use this to assess whether our cybersecurity strategy is, is working well and is meeting the goals of our business. And we can accordingly do budget and headcount planning. Uh, generally speaking, if the cost of the control is greater than the risk reduced, it may not be a good investment. Now let's, let's just take a look at the average annualized loss exposure in the table. The detection control will save the company about $8,000 annually. That is if we assume, uh, sorry, we, we are not using real numbers here. Netflix comps wouldn't allow um, us to use real numbers. So I'm just assuming the cost of the control to be $40,000. So if we consider that, the detection control will save the company about $8,000 annually. Now, risk averse organizations may want to use the maximum annualized loss exposure in the return on security investment calculations. And the risk seeking organizations may want to use the average uh, and not the maximum. That is because they would want to hold into capital for projects focusing on mitigating extreme losses. And $80,000 a baseline risk exposure may not be as extreme for risk seeking companies. So consider several treatment options that would influence the risk like the detection control in this example and repeat the process of control evaluation and cost benefit analysis, but on the same factor, be it average most likely or maximum for apples to apples comparison. And this allows uh, us to make uh, an informed decision. Some final thoughts here. Um, risk quantification is consistent accurate and repeatable. And um, I know some of you may argue that it's somewhat broken, but even if it is broken, I believe because it's repeatable, it allows for better decision-making. So if you're just starting out, consider quantifying uh, existential company risks and then operationalize. Um, finally, for those of you that are overwhelmed by this presentation, it's not as hard as it seems when I started my career, I had no background in cybersecurity or risk. So if I'm, I'm able to do it, you can definitely do it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I wanted to echo what, what Prashanti said. I actually had no experience in risk um, until I started at Netflix. And I certainly hadn't seen risk quantification. I had seen risk used as sort of fear and reasons to not do things and process. And so just learning that you can use risk to make better decisions and that you can quantify things. Uh, it's, it's been a, a huge, exciting thing to learn. So yeah, thank you all. Um, and Prashanti, if you go forward one more slide, we will um, share these slides, but we do have links in here to our job site. Um, also some really helpful user resources if you wanna start learning FAIR and uh, the, the Risk Quant Library. We, Marcus uh, and I worked on a blog post and it's open source, so please check that out. Um, try it out. It's, it's really pretty easy to use. And if you have ideas, please send over PRs. Uh, and then just some, some machine learning resources that we that I mentioned, uh, just some links about um, some more things you can try. So yeah, thank you. All. Thank, thank you. you.